The South Vietnamese soldiers in An Lop had survived the ferocious three-day assault of the 9th NLF Division. During April 16th, 17th, and 18th, the communist forces around An Lop stopped attacking to regroup and resupply. It did not accomplish its major objective to take An Lop by the 15th, but it certainly was not going to give up. Five regiments made preparations to hit An Lop simultaneously. The 9th 271st Regiment would attack from the west, the 272nd from the north, and the 95C from the northeast. The 5th NLF Division's 275th Regiment and 7th Pavan Division's 141st Regiment would destroy the airborne east of An Lop. Its new plan was to take Anlop within 5-10 to 10 days. So sure of victory, the communists declared publicly that the city would fall on the 20th of April. On the morning of April 19th, the communist forces started a massive artillery bombardment encompassing all of Anlop. Afterwards, all three 9th Division regiments launched their assaults into the city. The second major attack to seize Anlop started. At the same time, the 275th and 141st regiments attacked the airborne southeast of the city with six tanks. The 6th Airborne Battalion, alone on its fire support base with six 405mm cannons, faced the equivalent of six communist battalions. It was completely smashed and thrown off the hills. The first company was destroyed, and the two other had to disable their guns to withdraw. While all six tanks were destroyed by laws and airstrikes, none of it made a difference. Lieutenant Colonel Din, the commander of the 6th, had his men dig a foxhole, jumped in, and resolved to die. One of the advisors, 1st Lieutenant Ross Kelly, managed to lead a small breakout of 60 airborne that were later extracted by helicopter two days later. However, the 6th Airborne Battalion was rendered completely combat ineffective. With the defeat of the 6th Airborne, the last supporting artillery in the area were completely gone. Only airstrikes could provide heavy fire support now. The 5th and 8th Airborne Battalions, however, were closer to the city. The 5th was just east of Anlop, and the 8th was in the south. They could not be surrounded like the 6th, and held off attacks from the 275th and 141st Regiments, which assaulted them right after destroying the Windy Hill position. The 9th Division made desperate assaults from the east, north, and northeast for days, but were held back by the 5th Division, Rangers, and Rough Puffs. Advisors called in airstrikes close to friendly positions, helping South Vietnamese troops hold off the assault. Arc lights smashed North Vietnamese buildups before they could attack in full force. While the 6th Airborne were destroyed, the rest of the attack on Anlop failed. The 1st Airborne Brigade command post was moved into Anlop on April 21st. The 9th NLF Division, even with two extra regiments from the 5th and 9th Divisions, made three days of desperate attacks to try to meet the publicized April 20th deadline. Unfortunately, it passed, and the second attempt to take Anlop ended in failure. The attack slowed down on April 22nd as a result. The North Vietnamese couldn't take any more ground. In this lull in fighting, the elite 81st Airborne Rangers decided to take the initiative and launch small counterattacks into northern Anlop during the night. Sergeant First Class Jess Yurta, advisor with the 81st, directly called in supporting fire from an AC-130 Spectre in person. However, the 81st Airborne Ranger did not gain too much ground. At this point, both sides were stuck. Neither could make gains. The North Vietnamese held North Anlop, while the South Vietnamese held the southern half. Unfortunately, the less than 4,000 remaining South Vietnamese soldiers were trapped with around 20,000 civilians. The intense artillery bombardment of 1,000 to 2,000 shells a day forced everybody underground. Food and medical supplies were stretched thin. The Pavan realized this and forced any civilians they could find into the city to exacerbate the problem. All civilians that tried to flee were met with communist artillery and forced back in. President Nguyen Văn Thieu would later claim that their artillery killed 25,000 refugees trying to escape all three battlefields of An Lop, Con Tum, and Quang Tri. However, even with the sheer misery in An Lop, the second attempt to seize An Lop failed. Even then, while the North Vietnamese could not take An Lop by force, that did not mean they were defeated. If frontal assaults could not work, then a communist could try to outlast the defenders in a prolonged siege. They could starve the defenders out. 
their anti-aircraft net of 23mm, 27mm, and 57mm AA guns in an estimated 9 anti-air battalions were deployed around the city. On April 19th, another Vietnam Air Force C-123 was shot down, and the Vietnam Air Force had to completely stop all low-altitude resupplies. The previous day, a US Air Force C-130 was hit by intense anti-air fire and was forced to crash land near Lai Khe. The North Vietnamese could definitely starve out the South Vietnamese soldiers. The Vietnam and US Air Force were still trying to figure out how to resupply the soldiers in An Lop without losing aircraft. A new delivery system, dropping supplies from a high altitude, and using a device to open the parachutes at low altitude was created, called High Altitude Low Opening, or the HALO system. Unfortunately, it was very unreliable and many deliveries crashed into the ground. In one instance, a pilot hit a command bunker directly and wounded the soldiers. While this allowed aircraft to fly at 6,000 feet, safe from AA fire, the retrieval rate for supplies was very dismal. The situation was so desperate that some 5th Division men fired towards Arvin Rangers trying to retrieve supplies. Resupply for the city would continue to be a serious issue for weeks. Morale was stagnant. South Vietnamese forces could only wait, and Colonel Miller failed to get General Hung to push his forces to try to retake North An Lop. Hung refused to give any order like this, and many South Vietnamese troops hoped that the US airstrike would continue to hold the North Vietnamese back. Even then, for the next couple of weeks, the men in An Lop could take a small break. Far south of An Lop, for the men of the 21st Division trying to make their way to break the siege, this was when the fiercest fighting started. On the 22nd of April, a refugee column with a blue bus was moving from Juntan to Lai Khe between the 32nd and 33rd regiments. Pavan units started to open fire on the column, hitting the blue bus with an RPG, killing 4 and wounding 20 civilians. The North Vietnamese had maneuvered their 101st regiment right between both regiments. Realizing that the communists were in between, the 32nd Regiment struck southwards, and the 33rd Regiment struck northwards to try to clear the obstruction. Due to the destroyed blue bus in the center of the fighting, this engagement would be referred to as the Battle of the Blue Bus by 21st Division American advisors. After five days of very fierce fighting through bunkers and trenches, the two regiments linked up on April 29th, forcing the 101st out. A battalion from the 165th Pavan Regiment attached to the 101st acted as a rear guard while the 101st withdrew west. At the same time, on April 24th, the 31st Regiment was airlifted to the north of Juntan to safeguard the town while the Battle of the Blue Bus was finishing up. They would start to push forward on the 29th after being given arc light strikes ahead of the advance. Right in front of the 31st was the well entrenched Pavan 165th Regiment. On May 1st, the 31st got stuck in a heavy engagement with the 165th, becoming bogged down in the fighting and unable to progress. This would be called the Battle of Benchmark 75 afterwards. It took five days of eight arc lights, 142 tactical airstrikes, and an extremely heavy artillery bombardment to smash the 165th. It was during this time, on May 4th, that the North Vietnamese soldiers deployed the AT-3 Sager wire-guided anti-tank missile for the first time in 3 Corps. It had previously been seen in I Corps and II Corps, but not this far south up until now. It was used with limited success. Unfortunately, just as the 165th was on the verge of being destroyed by airstrikes and the advance of the 31st Regiment, the 209th Pavan Regiment arrived just in time to take the defense and allow the 165th to withdraw and reinforce. The 31st Arvin Regiment was stuck once again. The 21st Division, as a whole, kept on getting bogged down in trying to destroy trench networks and bunkers, and at this point, reaching Anlop was unthinkable. Resupply efforts were still relatively unsuccessful. High altitude C-130 flights had a low delivery percentage. On April 20th, only 45 out of 845 tons sent were retrieved by South Vietnamese forces inside the city. The US Air Force resorted to trying to deliver supplies during nighttime at low altitude, with C-130s painted black, but it was very difficult to deliver supplies in complete darkness. Additionally, the North Vietnamese figured out the pattern and managed to shoot down two C-130s on an April 24th and May 3rd respectively, with all crew members lost. 
Worse yet, on April 29th, an SA-7 guided missile was reportedly launched at an aircraft. This completely stopped all low-altitude resupply flights. General Hollingsworth estimated that only 30% of supplies made it to South Vietnamese hands. The resupply effort was still only inconsistent at best, making the situation in the city tense. Even with the continued siege of An Lop, the failure to take the city by the publicly announced date of April 20th started to demoralize the North Vietnamese. The 9th NLF Division Commander, Colonel Nguyen Thoi Bung, was criticized for failing to take An Lop. B-2 front leadership decided to give command of the attack to the 5th NLF Division. Colonel Van declared that his division would show the 9th how it should be done. The 5th had taken Lop Ninh, and its commander was confident he could take An Lop. His plan was to concentrate his attacks to divide South Vietnamese forces in half and crush each isolated group. Anti-aircraft guns would move along with these units to destroy strike aircraft. His headquarters moved to Hill 169 overlooking the city on May 1st. The 5th Division's E6 and 174th Regiments moved into the area. Along with the 141st Regiment already in the area, the 7th Pavan Division's 165th Regiment moved north towards southern Anlop. The fresh 21st Tank Battalion also arrived. Now, there were a total of 7 Communist Regiments surrounding the city. The South Vietnamese soldiers in Anlop were facing one final battle against seven regiments with a critical supply shortage, and the 21st could only inch forward when they were miles away. There were only 4,000 Arbin soldiers left, with 1,000 of them wounded. Everybody knew that the communists would throw every spare soldier they had against the city to try to retake it for the third time. The Battle of Anlop could very well end in disaster for South Vietnam.